So um, hopefully you can see the slides there, managing stress and overcoming anxiety. Um, and I, just one point, if we could just make sure that our microphones are muted uh, while we're speaking, um, this will just help the talk to be very clear. So just to begin again, I'd like to thank Kia, Kathy and Hallie for inviting this talk. Uh, it's obviously very timely given the current circumstances. And it's true, I am a trauma expert uh, specializing in post-traumatic stress disorder. But what can trauma and extreme stress teach us about coping with everyday life, about overcoming anxiety? As a psychologist, I specialize in helping people to overcome post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is the crippling stress reaction that afflicts soldiers and other survivors of terrible events. As a scientist, I develop and test strategies to prevent PTSD. I have built programs based on the latest science to improve resilience for people in the most stressful and dangerous jobs as police officers, firefighters, paramedics, and now ICU workers. In my 20 years of practice, I've noticed something remarkable. The tools that transform anxiety and stress are the same tools that support people to achieve extraordinary success. In this talk, I'm gonna give you a snapshot of the seven tools so that you can better manage the anxiety and stress in your own life to support you on your path to success. So the first tool is to focus on facts not feelings to deal with worry. Science shows that 88% of our worries never come true. One of the best ways to discover this is to keep a worry diary for a week, note your worry and then the outcome and tally it. How many worries did you have? How many came true? You'll likely discover that your worries come true much less often than you feel they will which is good news. It means that you, when you spot your worrying, you can remind yourself of a reassuring fact. Most of your worries don't come true. Research shows that the best thing to do when you spot your worrying is to disengage from it. How do you disengage from worry? A study carried out at King's in London found that people um, picturing the likely outcome to your worry, that is an outcome based on facts, not feelings, and of you coping no matter what comes your way, or picturing any positive image such as sunshine helped people to disengage from worry. It led to decreases in anxiety and worry. The team at King's trained people who had uncontrollable worry to practice replacing their worry with images of possible positive outcomes, or they trained them to talk through possible positive outcomes using words, not pictures in their mind's eye, or to picture positive images unrelated to their worries. Everyone in the study benefited from reductions in anxiety and distress and sustained these improvements one month later. So what this means is that when you spot your worrying, use this as a cue to picture a possible likely outcome to your worry or even a positive image like sunshine. You'll feel less anxious as a result. The next tool is to, to tap practical thinking. It's what I call practical thinking, to overcome overthinking. Everyone does it. We chew over the past from time to time. And when we're dwelling, our mood will plummet and unhappy memories are more likely to surface, which keeps us focused on unhappy thoughts. It's a vicious cycle leading to poor problem solving, more unhappy feelings, and in challenging times, more severe stress. Imagine this. You wake up early on Monday morning and you get ready for an important meeting you're chairing on Zoom at 9 a.m. You switch on your laptop and the screen is black. It doesn't start. You press the on and off button again and again. It doesn't start. Uh-oh, what's going on? Thoughts race through your mind. Why won't my laptop start? Why is this happening today of all days? Why didn't I spot any problems with it last night? Why do problems like this always happen to me? Imagine this is happening to you. How might you be feeling? Now imagine the same scenario again. And this time you think, how can I best deal with this? How can I chair the meeting at 9 a.m.? In the first scenario, with why thoughts swelling your mind, you'll be more inclined to run back to bed and pull the duvet over your head. In the second scenario, how thoughts guide problem solving and decision making. You'll be able to find a solution such as suggesting to chair the meeting over your mobile. So dwelling is an unproductive pattern of thinking. The more you do it, the more you strengthen the neural pathways in your brain, making it the default mode of thinking when you encounter disappointment or stress. Dwelling keeps depression going and it increases anxiety. 
So spot when your thoughts have turned to why and what if, and instead of spending energy trying to answer unanswerable questions, ask, how can I feel better now? How can I refocus to the task at hand? Then take the step that will help to boost you or your focus. You could hit the treadmill, a circuits class, or if that's not possible, try a bout of jumping jacks or even ringing a friend to ask what is new and good with them. All helpful strategies to get out of your head. Suddenly, the whys and what ifs will feel less important because you're giving them less attention and absorbing yourself in an activity that needs your full attention. So the next tool is to use then versus now to break the link with past events that fuel self-doubt. Then versus now is a trauma treatment tool that helps to unhook the present from the past by helping you to focus on how now is different to then rather than focusing on how the situations may be similar. For example, if you've spoken up in a meeting and had a flat response, next time focus on how different the new environment is to the past, not how similar it is. Perhaps there are different team members in the meeting room, your slides are different. Notice how keen people look to hear what you have to say. Focus on the many ways now is different to them. Focusing on what you can see and hear in the here and now keeps you rooted in the present and gets your attention out of your head and away from feelings and memories of self-doubt. It keeps you absorbed in the task at hand, which is where you need to be to manage anxiety and stress. The next tool to manage anxiety and stress is to plan ahead. This is a really important tool and very important for the current times. There is science to planning ahead. Several studies that have come out of our lab show that making a plan in the evening for the next day and including one enjoyable activity in your plan dramatically improves mood, well-being, and productivity and reduces anxiety. Plan your workday in half-hour chunks and use the plan as a schedule to guide you, revamping and recreating it through the day, especially when you discover that you've wildly underestimated how long it takes to reply to those emails, rewrite that code, or write up your project results. Planning ahead works to reduce anxiety and stress because it moves routine decision-making to the night before which frees up mental energy to tackle challenging tasks the following day. Having a detailed plan makes you more productive, meaning you'll be more likely to reach your goals. And of course, including a fun activity, even for a few minutes in your plan, makes it more likely that you'll do something fun, which increases well-being. The next tool is to use the three-minute carrot. The three-minute carrot is helpful to overcome avoidance. Avoidance keeps anxiety going. There's no other outcome but avoidance. Achieving a more centered life means kicking avoidance. It means choosing what is best for you rather than what is easiest. One common behavior among students and staff is procrastination, putting off for tomorrow what would be best to get done today. If you're struggling to get started with something you're avoiding, use the three minute carrot. Give yourself permission to try the new behavior for just three minutes, then reassess how you're feeling giving yourself permission to carry on for another three minutes if you choose to or to stop. You can also break the first step into tiny steps and take the first tiny step to start. It's manageable to complete a small step like write an outline for my essay or grant application before the bigger step, write the background section. Completing the small step gives a sense of achievement and a breath of success to motivate next steps. And after the first step, get cozy with smart language to resist temptations to give back into avoidance, which will increase anxiety. So use the words I don't rather than I can't when tempted away from your goals. Studies suggest that if you say I can't, you'll be more likely to give in to temptation and give up the goal you had planned to work towards. But if when you're faced with temptation and you use, you use the words I don't, you'll be much more inclined to follow through with your goals. So if when a mate asks you to have a drink over Zoom, you respond with, I don't drink on Tuesdays, you'll be much more likely to follow through with the original goal you had planned for the evening, which might have been writing that essay or working on that application. Why is that? Using the words, I don't, in response to temptations increases your sense of empowerment with goals, making you more likely to work towards them. Another tool to help you over the start line is to make decisions based on how you want to feel, not on how you're actually feeling. Most people make decisions based on how they're feeling in the moment rather than on how they want to feel in the future. So one of the ways to overcome avoidance and reduce anxiety is to consider how you want to feel in the future and to be guided by this today. So if exercising will make you feel energized and happy, 
or finishing up an admin task will make you feel relieved and rewarded, make your decision to get started based on how you know it will make you feel rather than on how you're already feeling. The next important tool is focus. It absolutely matters what you focus on and how you focus. People who manage stress well choose to focus on what they can do rather than on what they can't. They realize that they don't have endless years to bring their goals into reality, so they optimize their time. And one of the ways they do this is learning to focus efficiently without distraction. So there are two types of focus, helpful and unhelpful. Unhelpful attention is focus that's gone inside ourselves to our thoughts, our feelings, our fears, or sensations in our body like our heart rate. And unhelpful focus will always raise anxiety and increase stress. For example, if I was worried about sweating and I focused all of my attention on my forehead here, as if I had sweat patches, I'd soon lose my train of thought. And I'd be working hard to cover up my sweat patches like this and possibly looking away, which would draw more rather than less attention to me and would make me quite distracted. Helpful attention on the other hand, which is also called externally focused attention, is the kind of attention that's out of our head and in the world. So ignoring my fake sweat patches and focusing on our talk will make me feel more at ease and less anxious, even though you can see that I've, I had poured water on my forehead. Um, people are most satisfied when they're absorbed in the task at hand, particularly when they're absorbed in something that is challenging enough to be stimulating, but not so challenging that it is frustrating. And finally, possibly the most important tool for dealing with anxiety and stress, certainly for dealing with stress, is to extend the compassion you extend to others to yourself. Speaking to yourself with kindness lowers stress hormones and makes you more optimistic, as well as a better problem solver, whereas self-critical talk zaps motivation. In a study of almost 200 students, Kristen Neff and her team looked at different aspects of having compassion for oneself, that's self-compassion, and its links with positive emotions and qualities. Self-compassion is that capacity to extend kindness towards ourselves in instances of pain or failure, the capacity to normalize our difficult experiences by recognizing that people around the world have similar struggles and that our struggles are part of the larger human experience as we're learning with coronavirus. It's also the capacity to see painful thoughts and feelings as passing rather than identifying with them. Neff and her team discovered that self-compassion was linked to happiness, optimism, positive emotions, and qualities such as wisdom, personal initiative, curiosity, agreeableness, extroversion, and con conscientiousness. Her team concluded that self-compassion may give rise to happiness and feelings of calm because it creates feelings of warmth, connection with others, and a sense of balance or equilibrium. When we're happy, we're less likely to ruminate, or dwell about the past or worry about the future, which is linked to anxiety and depression. A self-compassionate mindset is linked to adaptive coping skills and could keep people feeling optimistic about the future. Feelings of compassion for oneself and others is linked to greater activation of the left prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain linked to joy and optimism. If you're struggling to speak to yourself with kindness, you could first try to think kind thoughts or carry out kind gestures for other people. The act of being kind will boost your mood and put you in a frame of mind where it's easier for you to be kind to yourself. So just to wrap up, everyone feels anxious and stressed from time to time. There are tools to help these times become less frequent so you can progress your path to success without feeling so overwhelmed. Remember, facts, not feelings to overcome worry. Use a worry diary and in the midst of worrying, picture a possible positive outcome to the worry or any positive uplifting image. The next tool, the second tool was practical thinking. It's not overthinking. Dwelling is your cue to get out of your head and spot how to move forwards. The third tool, then versus now, helps to break the link to the past, unhooking the present from past events that fueled self-doubt or anxiety. Plan ahead, break your days into half hour chunks and assign your tasks, really important, and include a fun activity, even if brief in your plan. Kick avoidance, start a new behavior with a tiny step. Make decisions based on how you want to feel, not on how you're actually feeling. Use a three minute carrot to get started with big deadlines. And remember, I don't versus I can't to resist temptations. 
focus. Use self-focused focused attention, which increases anxiety as a cue to get out of your head and into the world. And finally, compassion. Be kind to your mind. Extend the kindness you offer others to yourself. The world benefits from you and what you have to offer. Transforming your anxiety and stress will lead to a stress-free life with less stress and help you to support a path to success. There's more about these tools uh, in the book, Be Extraordinary, um, which is at the bottom of the slide. So I'd like to stop there. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Jen. That was such a clear and practical um, explanation based on the latest research and I'm sure others will join me in find, having found that extremely helpful um, and extremely interesting. Um, we've got a number of questions that have been submitted by people who have joined the se uh, this seminar, um, too many really to go through um, each of them in turn. So what we've done instead is to try to pull out some of the key themes from the questions that have been asked and we'll be asking the panel um, about those particular topics. So I'd like to just take this opportunity to introduce um, Polly Waite as well. Do you want to give us a wave, Polly? Um, and also Robin Dunbar, who are both also from the Department of Experimental Psychology. And I'm Cathy Creswell, also from the Department of Experimental Psychology. And I'll just be steering us through this next part. So the first question was uh, reflects a question that came up from a number of people. And this was really about recognizing that, of course, stress and anxiety are, are normal emotions, as Jen mentioned, that uh, are going to be understandable in difficult situations. So people talked about, of course, the current context, difficult work situations when dealing with challenging interactions with other people. At these times, it might be easy to feel stressed, anxious, feel overwhelmed. Um, so how should we think about managing stress in those contexts when our objective reality is stressful? So Robin, if I could go to you first for your thoughts on that. Okay, I, I, I think the starting point really is that one of the key reasons we have friendships in, in, in ordinary everyday life is that they are probably the best medicine we have for well-being and, and, you know, sort of lifting us and, and, and counteracting illnesses and, and all these things. Uh, now, obviously, we're a bit sort of stymied about getting out with friends at the moment, but the, the key thing is the mechanism that at least we understand uh, underpins this, and that really seems to come out of the endorphin system. What you do with friends triggers the endorphin system, and endorphins just make you feel lighter and more contented and calmer and kind of do all the things that Jen says actually in many ways um, and and those are triggered by things like laughter singing dancing eating socially drinking socially those kind of things now you know a lot of those we can actually do at the moment um, virtually so you know uh, people are doing Zumba on zoom and stuff like that uh, uh, do it I mean it just you know sort of you come out of it you, the world feels better already at the end of the session. Um, so, so, uh, uh, and I guess things like singing, I mean, I'm <laughs> rather bemused by the Italians singing from their balconies because, you know, okay, only the Italians could do opera <laughs> public like that. But, you know, what a brilliant idea. I and mean, everybody, you know, who's there, been there at the time, comes away saying this is, gives you such a lift. It's incredible. But at the end of the day, since a lot of these things are sort of semi social, there is one default thing which triggers the endorphin system like mad, and that is any physical exercise. So my suggestion is if you can't do anything else, go for a run because every jogger will tell you the day is better after their morning jog. Thank you. And I definitely need a three minute carrot to get me started doing that. <laughs> um, Jen, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? I, I fully agree with Robin. Um, and the exercise, we think exercise is helpful because it absolutely gets you out of your head. So it's very, it helps to disengage from the worry and, and the rumination that can increase anxiety and stress. But what the research also shows that's really helpful is to plan your work day and ensuring that you include breaks in your plan for the next day. And so, you know, when we're working at home during this time, it's so easy to be glued to the screen, trying to stay afloat of emails and new work that's arisen as a result of COVID. 
However, it's important to structure the day and to break the day into half hour chunks and assign tasks and include an enjoyable activity in, the, in one of those chunks in, of time. So during your breaks and making sure you get up and out for 10 to 15 minutes um, and go for that run if possible at some point during the day. And then I, I think in terms of worries, you know, when we're alone, um, it's very easy to come back into our heads and give our thoughts a lot of attention and our worries a lot of attention. So it's important to remember some of the facts and that is, you know, 88% of our worries don't come true. And I, I think a worry diary is really helpful um, to help us discover that. And if we are getting very stressed and worried, just even, you know, picturing a positive, positive, positive outcome and then giving ourselves a pat on the back, remembering that compassion that we extend to ourselves and other people actually increase our, increases our mood and makes us more optimistic and a better problem solver to manage the problems we may be facing, including our stress. So I think those are some helpful tools to add on top of that. And I think those are really nice points to think about in relation to, you know, many people are asking questions, not just about the current situation, but also general work stressors, interpersonal stressors, and those sound like very good tips there. I was going to follow up more about stressors related specifically to the current situation, because obviously there are many challenges, isolation, family stress, managing the competing demands of work and family. So I think um, Robin and Jenny have touched on those really nicely. So I'll just go to Polly now to... Uh, for any additional thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Jen, for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I think lots of it is really applicable um, for, for people who are in a situation where they're a parent or carer of children. Um, we've been running an online survey actually called CoSpace, tracking the mental health of young people and working out how best to support families over this time. <clears throat> and one of the things that we found in our early findings is that the majority of parents are, are reporting trying to juggle work and looking after their children and two thirds of them feeling like they're not sufficiently needing the, need, um, meeting the needs of both their work and their children. So, you know, if you're a parent and care and feeling overwhelmed, you are in, you know, that's entirely normal and something that most people are experiencing. And I think particularly for families where you might have children that are younger or with additional needs or there's not a parent at home to support the children with um, education full time. You know, they're under huge amounts of stress at the moment. So I think the first thing to remember is that on the whole, children are remarkably resilient. And also, secondly, it's a really good opportunity to help children recognize that a certain amount of anxiety and stress is normal. Um, but the crucial thing as a parent is really showing children how you can deal with it. So going back to what Jen and Robin have been talking about, you know, working out what you need to do to feel like you can cope and feel in control is really important and then helpful for children, especially those that are prone to um, being more stressed, helping you see that you're dealing with it in a proactive way. And I think also this is an opportunity to develop children's life skills. So, you know, maybe think about the ways your children, your family can help support things domestically like cleaning and cooking and other jobs and ways that your family can enjoy time together. Um, and then, you know, if the stress relates to things your children are or aren't doing, which, you know, might be particular issues around times that teenagers are getting out of bed or, you know, engaging in work or agreeing to do some exercise. I think it is about, you know, being compassionate, as Jen says, trying to keep regular channels of communication open, um, finding times perhaps when people aren't stressed, have regular family meetings and thinking about compromise to reach practical solutions that, that work to some extent for everybody. And then finally, you know, really trying to find the support where you can get it. And that might be about other people reading a story to your children over Zoom each evening, you know, reaching out to them. Maybe they can play games with your children, or, you know, using video conferencing. And I think, again, connecting with other parents um, and accessing support where you need it is really, really important. Thank you. And I think um, some of those, well, all of those tips are probably quite useful for us when thinking about not just challenges with families, but any interactions, you know, and stressful interactions with other people and how we can manage those. So thank you. One of the other questions that came up quite a lot related to the fact that, of course, there are many fundamental differences in our personalities, in our biological makeup. So to what extent is our level of the level of stress or anxiety that we experience really changeable? versus something that some of us will just have to learn to manage. So Jen, could I go to you on that question? Sure. Of, of course, genetics do contribute to anxiety and how we manage stress. However, I think it's important to look at what maintains anxiety and what maintains anxiety are our thoughts and behaviors. 
So it's really important to make sure that we tackle behaviors like avoidance, which we talked about in this talk, which increases anxiety, and approach anxious thoughts with facts, testing them to see how accurate they really are. For example, when we feel panicky, we may think that we'll pass out or we won't cope and should therefore sit down and take deep breaths. But unless you have a heart condition, this is the worst thing you can do. And instead, I would encourage you to do the opposite. So if you think you'll pass out, stand up and do some jumping jacks. You can't faint when your heart is racing, for example. So I really think that the key is um, to look at the thoughts and behaviors that we may be engaging in to help to break the, the cycle of what keeps anxiety going once we spot it. Thank you. Polly, did you want to add anything further on that point? Yeah, yeah so actually, um, in the child anxiety literature, there's been quite a lot of attention trying to understand you know, what potentially causes it. And of course, it's a complex interaction between lots of different factors. You know, we know genetics is part of that. So um, inheriting genes accounts for about 30% of the variants when we're trying to understand um, what, what contributes to child anxiety. And so, you know, one of the most robust predictors is temperament. So if you have the kind of temper when you tend to withdraw from things or avoid or respond fearfully to new situations, then that puts you at greater risk. Um, and of course, someone who's genetically more predisposed might find things like the current environment just generally much more stressful to deal with. So there's a real interaction. But I think sometimes people do worry that they might be hardwired um, you know, and, and more sort of biologically attuned to develop anxiety. But actually, you know, having that kind of genetic makeup is not bad news at all. So recently, researchers have suggested that actually for those of us with that genotype, we might show the largest benefit um, in low stress or enriching environments. And if you think about the skills and strategies that Jen's talked about, or having therapy more broadly, you can see that as creating an enriching environment. So, and in fact, some studies have found that groups of people with more um, genetic vulnerability actually do just as well, if not better, um, when they have a psychological treatment. So I think it's about, you know, understanding that, of course, biological factors contribute, but that doesn't mean that you can't change. Um, and being able to see that can help you let go of those un unhelpful beliefs that things might be hardwired to see that actually change is possible for everybody. Thank you very much. We, we had a lot of questions where people were asking about um, how they could best support others around them with their mental health. So that might have been as a, as a manager, as a friend, as a parent or carer. So we're very interested to hear your thoughts on, you know, how can each of us help others manage their stress and anxiety? So Robin, if I could go to you first of all. Um, I, I think in the end, it always seems to me the best thing you can do in these contexts is encourage people to take part in one of these kind of social activities. And, and you know, the one we've really come to see as magic is singing. I mean, obviously, this is a bit, this is a more general point than the current situation, but there are lots of choirs online at the moment. You can sing, sing by Zoom or something. Um, but singing just has an absolutely magical effect on your sense of well-being and your sense of engagement with the people you're doing it with. It turns complete strangers into lifelong friends. I mean, we've known each other forever since. Um, in, in under an hour, it's just extraordinary. That nothing else does it so well. Um, I, I, I just kind of add a, a kind of, a, a, there's a kind of lot of emphasis always on sort of talking to people and uh, getting them to, to think about their their, their, their emotions and, uh, and, and what they're thinking, as it were. And I, I, have a, I have one caution to add to that, which is simply that this really works well for girls because that's how girls manage and maintain their social relationships. And it just doesn't seem to work for boys because it's not how boys create their friendships. Boys create friendships by doing stuff together. And you know, my, my kind of cartoon version of that is that there's a classic picture of two old Greek men sitting either side of a, a, a table outside a cafe with their glasses of ouzo in the sunshine, not speaking a word to each other, uh, but sipping their ouzo from time to time. And they are bonding. Believe me, they are bonding in a way that only boys will do. <laughs> so I kind of just uh, sort of throw that into the mix, really. I think, you know, it, getting people to talk is really good because it works very well with girls. Um, I think you just have to be more imaginative with blokes. 
Thank you very much. And obviously, many of uh, people asking these questions were asking as thinking as in their roles as parents or carers. So if I could go to you now, Polly, um, particularly also thinking about the extent to which the the seven tools that Jen spoke about, you know, apply when you're thinking about helping children and young people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think, um, I mean, I, I, your point's really interesting, Robin, I think that's right. It's about achieving a balance, isn't it? Talking mm. and opening up to some degree, but also mm. not dwelling on it and making sure you take action. I think those kind of principles apply with children as well. So, um, so I think that's right. It is about having those conversations with children. And, you know, some of the research that we've done really shows that children often worry about talking about their fears um, because they worry about upsetting or burdening other people, their parents particularly. So I think, you know, having an environment where children feel they can talk to you and their fears aren't dismissed. It's really tempting as a parent to sort of say it's going to be fine, you know, don't be silly. Um, but actually, you, you know, you do want to reinforce to them that you are going to take their fears seriously. And it's really hard in the current environment because there is so much that we don't, we're not able to control. We can't sadly reassure, you know, the, a child that their granny is going to be okay. We just don't know that for sure. So it's about, you know, responding in a way that the child can trust. Um, and I think, you know, finding times to talk to children where um, no one's stressed. So bedtimes can often be a really nightmarish time when those conversations open up. So I think, you know, agreeing a time to, to talk about it the next day can often be helpful rather than opening those conversations up now. And I think how, you know, Jen was talking about using dwelling as a cue to focus on other things. I think actually, you know, at night time, that, that can be particularly helpful, getting the child to be able to think of other things they can switch their attention to and then me, maybe revisit it the following day where you can do things like using the worry diaries, which are great. And, and the strategies uh, moving from why to how, I think it, that, you know, that's a really lovely strategy that's very doable. Um, and then I think, you know, building on everything that's been said before, taking action of some kind. So working out, you know, what is it the child's stressed about? So one of the things that we've you know, a lot of our teenagers have been talking about is worries about things being different when they go back to school, particularly in, in relation to friendships and relationships. So rather than worrying about maybe friendships being different when they return, encouraging them to do things that make them feel more connected to friends now. Um, so that might be, you know, speaking to them over the video or phone call, finding other ways to feel connected are really important. And we know that actually with teenagers with low mood kind of activating themselves building on Jen's point about, you know, planning things in, doing enjoyable activities, we know that's really, really important and that can really make a difference to young people when they're feeling low and feeling a bit hopeless about things. Thank you. Um, and I think very much in line with many of the themes that have come up today, many of the questions that we received re really reflected on the unhelpful patterns that we can get into when we're under stress, um, but which then may contribute to keeping stress going. So, for example, negative thought patterns, particular destructive behaviours, feelings of guilt and shame. So how can we make sense of these responses and how can we change these vicious cycles? Robin, could I go to you first? Um, yeah, I, I think my comment is simply going to be really uh, the point that Polly just made about friendships, sort of when you re-engage with somebody after a gap, there's an element of kind of uncertainty about the friendships. And, and, and this comes out very strongly out of everything we've done on friendship, is friendships decay very, very quickly, surprisingly quickly, within weeks or, or at most months in terms of their quality, if you don't see somebody at the normal rate. And, and we do things like, you know, if, if we've not spoken to somebody on a phone for longer than a gap than we would normally have done, our next phone call with them is much longer, as though we're kind of trying to repair the relationship, bring it back up. So I kind of think it is important to kind of try and encourage people to keep those existing friendships going. This, this, I hasten to say this doesn't happen with family relationships. Family relationships seem to be much more robust. Um, fa families will tolerate any amount of abuse from is, is what seems to happen until they've had too much and then, then it cracks. But friendships just decay very, very quickly. And, and literally within a matter of two months, the quality of a friendship will have declined if you haven't seen, seen them. Um, and so it's just encouraging people to be able to keep those relationships going by virtual means uh, as necessary, really. Thank you. Um, and Jen, would you like to comment on that question? Yeah, so um, I think friendship and support is hugely important. And 
but also when we're thinking about breaking the vicious cycles, it's, um, it's important to recognize that our thoughts and behaviors are influencing how we feel. And a step in feeling better is taking steps to change them if possible. So if we're avoiding something like a deadline or exercise, um, we'll most likely feel guilty. And recognizing that guilt thoughts are linked to things like having uh, sentences with the word should in them, for example, like I should exercise, I should be working on this project. And as soon as our minds hear the word should, we instantly feel a desire to avoid what we should be doing. And that leads to procrastination and feelings of guilt and shame and, and so forth. So one of the tools I had mentioned was um, practicing future feeling thinking. And so that's making decisions about how you want to feel in the future and being guided by this today. So it was really, this comes under the realm of the three minute carrot. So if you know that exercising will make you feel upbeat and uplifted, make the decision to exercise based on how you know it will make you feel, not on how you're already feeling. And the same applies with getting started with a deadline. We also spoke about a few tools in the talk that will help um, in relation to the three minute carrot and tips to keep going. And with thoughts, I think we, thoughts that are part of that vicious cycle that, that fuel anxiety and stress, we, it can be helpful to be open to the possibility that they're not facts and that we can test them and we can collect evidence for or against them. And then we can update them. And then the updated thought is likely to lead to less anxiety and less, less stress. Thank you. So we are approaching the end of this session, but before we do finish, I would like to go to each of the panel and just ask if they have any other final comments that they'd like to make. So Robin. I, I think I might just pick up on what Gemma was uh, just saying about scheduling. I mean, that's clearly really in many ways the secret to it and, and being a bit disciplined about it. But it just made me think that actually, if you, make a little slot for some sort of exercise you know it doesn't matter whether it's going for a jog uh, 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 as you can do now uh, through the woods as it were or, or zoom, uh, zumba on zoom as they say um, the thing about exercise is once you get into the swing of it it makes you want to do it again so there's a kind of incentive to keep making a slot available so I, i'd go for a, a little gentle exercise it's always good for the mind Thank you. Polly, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, well, a few weeks on a few weeks ago on Twitter, the writer Damien Barr posted a poem and um, and it sort of recognised that the fact and I think it came from the fact that a lot of people were talking about us all being in the same boat. And he talked about we're all in the same storm, but we might not all be in the same boat. Um, and that really resonated for me because I think the reality is that, you know, people are in all, all sorts of different situations right now that may not be comparable. And, some people might be in a much less watertight, seaworthy boat than others. And I think it's just about not beating yourself up if you find yourself in a situation that's so much more challenging than other people. Um, and, you know, just looking for things like what can you control? Um, you know, what activities give you a sort of sense of belonging, a sense of purpose? What can you do to kind of shore your boat up and get as much support as you possibly can? And, you know, things like getting outside in nature, you know, doing exercise, all the things we've talked about, I think are really important. Trying to notice the positives, you know, the fact that you might have a bit more time in bed, you might be able to wear comfortable clothes, you might now be a technological genius. Uh, you know, all of those things, I think trying to harness them, but at the end of the day, you know, being compassionate towards yourself and others and not giving yourself a hard time if you're not being productive in the way that you'd like to, or potentially might see other people being. Thank you. Jen, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, and I think it, it can be helpful to recognize that what we're going through, whilst it is a massive change, uh, it is also temporary. And we are changing day by day in terms of the information that we get and the plans that we have in relation to keeping safe with coronavirus. And whilst we are at home, um, it won't be forever and we will be able to socialize at some point. So sometimes just knowing that the situation that we're in, however anxiety and stress filled it is, is temporary, can be helpful. And the other thing that I think is really important um, that I'd like to get across is how important it is to get out of our heads. And I don't mean blind drunk, but I mean how important it is to shift our attention away from our thinking and getting into the outside world or the task at hand can really reduce stress and anxiety. And this is one of the reasons why exercise is so helpful because when we are exercising, it's actually really hard to also be, be worrying and um, you know, dwelling about things from the past. 
So I think that can be very helpful. And I, and I think also, you know, finally, the sense of compassion, so important to speak to ourselves with kindness. And this lowers stress hormones, makes us more optimistic, better problem solvers to solve the stress that we are experiencing whilst we're going through this corona pandemic. So compassion is really, really important for ourselves and for other people.